Good morning and welcome to Train of the United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Jeff and I'm so glad that you're all here with us today. A welcome to our in-person audience as well as to our online guests. Today is Rally Sunday, and so we'll be kicking off our Sunday School program this morning, which is a, a wonderful day that we've uh, waited for for quite a while now, and we are glad to see kids here and glad to uh, dedicate the teachers and, and pray for all of you as we begin our Sunday School year. I do want to give a quick announcement about these prayer cards. I had said a few weeks ago that the way we're going to try to do prayers now because of being online and not wanting to share confidential information that people don't want shared out into the internet. If you would like us to pray a prayer request during church, okay, I'd like you to fill out one of these prayer cards. Please write it legibly so that I can make sure that I read it. But what I'm asking you to do is fill those out early in the service. Like if you want to make a prayer request, go ahead and fill that out now or soon. And then during the singing of the first song, the ushers will come by and collect those and get them to me. So, and, and then, so here's the way it works. If you want your prayer request read, hand it to an usher, and I'll look them over and read it during the prayer time. If you don't want it read and you just want to share it uh, for me personally or, you know, to be kept private, then just put it in the offering plates at the back of the church on your way out or, or give it to me privately or whatever. But if you want a prayer request shared, fill it out and send it into the ushers during the, during the first song. Okay, I hope that's clear. And at this time, uh, I'd like to introduce our worship leader. Good morning, my name is Denise Douglas and I'm glad to be here with you and I'm glad that you're all here with us today. Um, uh, there are many, many opportunities to um, participate here at church, so look through your bulletin and pick out the things that you would like to do, and we encourage you to come and um, make it more than just a Sunday worship service, but make it a lifestyle. I wanted to share with you a devotion that I read um, a couple of weeks ago, and it was about carrying laundry baskets down the steps. And I, my laundry is in the basement, so I do have to carry my baskets down. And oftentimes when I'm doing that, my feet can't see where they're, I can't see where my feet are going. So I'm kind of walking in faith, hoping that the next step is right below where I think it is, because the laundry basket is obstructing my view. And in thinking about God, although we can't see him, we know he is there, just like I know those steps are there as I walk them down them. And faith is like that. We believe even though we cannot see, and we pray knowing that God hears us whether we can see him or not. If you come today with an obstructed view of where God is, I hope that he opens your eyes this morning. Let's pray together as we get our hearts ready for worship. God, we come to you this morning knowing that you are here with us, speaking to, speak to us today as we praise and worship you. Amen. And I had forgotten one very important announcement. Uh, there is one apple pie downstairs that was left from yesterday's luncheon. And if somebody wants that, if you'd make a donation to our youth ministry and see Ken, first come, first serve. One left homemade by Lisa Hester. Um, so now's the time to fill out those prayer cards. And as we sing this, or as we sing this first song, and go ahead, musicians can come up now to, to sing. Um, we're gonna sing with them. And if you would send your prayer card down to the end of the aisle, uh, Bill and Ken are gonna come down and pick them up during this first song and, and bring them up to me. Let's stand together as we sing, We Declare Your Majesty.
Oh, sorry. We have a tree. The kingdom kids can come up and sing, and the rest of you can have a seat. All right, everybody stand up here with me. Stand next to each other. You can move over to the middle here. There we go. Everybody ready? And you can stay right there for our children's message and let's have the rest of the kids come up as well for our children's message. Good morning, boys and girls. How are we all today? God, I'm so glad to see you all here. I have something special for you, and before I give it, before I distribute it, I want to do a children's lesson with it. So I have a bag of candy that was given to us by our music director, Dan Lutz. You can all look at him and wave and say, thank you, Dan. And I'm going to ask Miss Heather to come up here and help me with this, just to do a little illustration. Miss Heather is our lay leader, and I'm going to hand her this bag of candy. And we're going to talk in my sermon today about why bad things happen. And that's a hard concept for us to understand. Why do people fall and get hurt? Why do our loved ones sometimes die? Why do earthquakes and hurricanes strike in different places and tornadoes and cause destruction and a lot of problems? Uh, why do people get sick? Why is there a pandemic right now? A lot of these questions, and they're too big probably for you as kids to understand, I'm going to tell you a secret. They're too big for us adults to understand too. We've tried. We've tried over the years, but we don't always have a good answer. I want to try to illustrate at least one approach to that problem with, with this little ex example today, all right? So Dan has given this wonderful bag of candy. Let's pretend that you are all very, very hungry and that you all need something, a little bit sweet and a little bit sour, to satisfy that urge, okay? 
So we're going to pretend that all of you are hungry and that you need something sweet and sour. And then as it turns out, my goodness, we've got a bag right here of Sour Patch Kids zombie version. And that's a type of candy that, guess what? It's a little bit sweet and it's a little bit sour. Perfect for what you need, right? All right, so here's the thing. All right, Heather's got that bag. Dan's given her the bag. Heather has the bag. And now you all have this problem, okay? And I can satisfy that problem. So I'm going to ask Miss Heather to hand me those bags of candy and then distribute them to all of you, okay? So let's go. Heather, let me have some candy. I'm going to hand it out to these kids here. All right, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Wonderful. Keep coming. Keep coming. I need more. All right, very good. Very good. All right. Hold on. Drop one. Uh oh, drop another one. Here we go. All right. Here we go. All right. That's, I, think, I think that's probably enough. All right. That's probably enough. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Heather. You can go sit down now. I appreciate your help. All right. So now I've got all of this sweet and sour candy here. But I don't know if I want to share it with all of you. I don't know. This stuff's pretty good. I like this myself. I might, I might just hang on to this for a while. You guys could manage a little bit longer, right? I don't have to share this. You think I do have to share it? Well, here's the thing, all right, boys and girls, here's the problem. Here's one of those reasons we look at why evil and suffering exists. It's because you say, I need to share this, but I really don't. You see, I have a choice. I have a choice. I could either share this with you, or I could keep it to myself. That's my choice. I don't have to do either one of those things, but I can choose to. And I can choose to hold on to it if I want to. Ah, uh, here comes Dane. He saw candy up there. I said, all right. But Dane, I'm not giving it away anyway. I'm holding on to it. So, so if I hold on to it, then what happens? If I hold on to this candy, the, somebody's asked me to give it away. Somebody's handed it to me to give it away. But if I hold on to it and don't give it away, then your needs are not met. You're not satisfied. And, and whose fault is it? Is it Miss Heather's fault? Is it Mr. Dan's fault? Whose fault is it? It's my fault, right? It's my fault. So sometimes we want to blame God for things and we want to say this is God's fault. When the truth is God gave somebody what we need and because of our choices, we don't share what we need. And as a result, the innocent can sometimes suffer. There's a proverb I want to share with you. It's from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. It says this, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not withhold good, or Sour Patch Kids, from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. I have the power to act. I need to make the choice to act. And sometimes we need to make the choice to help others rather than to hold on to all the things God has given us. When we help others, we are answering people's prayers. And so today I am going to share all these things with you. And you go, can take them and you can do whatever you want. You can choose to share them with somebody or you can choose to just eat them all yourself. It's up to you. It is your choice. But I do want to uh, remind you, you can share it with your brother. Very nice, Natalie. Here you go. Um, I, I just want you to remember that lesson and to say that sometimes we have the power to act and we should not withhold good from those who deserve it. You are welcome. Let us say a prayer together. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you have blessed us and that you have given us things. And Lord, we pray that you would help us not to hoard them, not to hold them, but to pass them on to others that good might result. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now boys and girls, I'm gonna ask you to go back to your seats for just a few minutes, okay? Don't go down for Sunday school yet. You can go back to your seats. We're gonna do a dedication to your teachers and then we'll have you all go back down. All right, uh, isn't it wonderful to see all the kids in church? We're going to uh, dedicate our teachers now and so I would invite all of the Sunday school teachers to please come forward at this time and stand up here at the front.
I'm gonna be finding Sour Patch Kids for days. I don't remember where I stashed them all. You guys want Sour Patch Kids? <laughs> sure, we'll share. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> all right, very good. Morning. I'm Julie Mardick. I'm one of the directors of the Sunday School along with Karen West. We are so excited to see everybody. We've missed you guys. I'm um, excited to get started. Thank you to everybody who's um, volunteered their time and, and effort for the kids. We really appreciate it. So um, we're going to get started with kicking off Rally Sunday. All right, there is a call and response here in your bulletin, and I would invite you to read the congregational response part at the appropriate time. It's in bold face, and then Julie and I will take turns uh, with the others, and then teachers and leaders, you have a part as well. And at the very end, it's everybody. Each of us is invited by Jesus to take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. From among us, we call persons to serve as teachers and leaders. We call them to share the grace of God through their lives and through their teaching. We thank you, Lord, for those who have experienced your presence in their lives and who now serve as teachers and leaders. Teachers and leaders, you have said yes to God's call to the teaching ministry. Through you, the gospel message will be shared once again. Do you accept this commission? Yes. yes, we do. We thank God for this opportunity. In God's name, we commit ourselves to helping children, youth, and adults know and experience God through Jesus Christ. These teachers and leaders have answered God's call to teach the faith on our behalf. Will you support them? We pledge our support to you. We will pray for you and we will encourage you in your work as teachers and leaders. We join you in the lifelong journey of being faithful witnesses to the power of God's love through Jesus Christ. God of all that was and ever will be, the world needs to know and experience the healing truth of your gospel. Strengthen us as we grow in faith. May we share that faith with others so that your name is glorified and souls are one to you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to introduce the teachers, their helpers, um, as I call them, uh, the children can follow their particular teacher for their grade um, out and downstairs. Okay, for preschool, we have Teacher Cindy Ligman, helper Noreen Goodlin, Karen Myers, helper Dina Stevens, and Megan Hartman, who could not be here today, and um, Michelle Helfer. So this is preschool through first grade. So any of the kids, you can follow your teachers down. Second and third grade is Megan Small, who could not be here today, and myself. Um, second and third grade, if you just want to wait till I walk down, then you can follow me down. Fourth through sixth grade is Amy and Joe Fulmerage and Stephanie Branch. If you guys want to follow them down. And the seven through high school is Mark Trzinski. All right, a special thanks to all these teachers. Let's give them a round of applause.
and a special thanks to parents uh, and of course all the kids for coming here and uh, learning about Jesus at Trinity Sunday School program. We are blessed today. For our pastoral prayer time then, I have received uh, some prayer cards back, so thank you for sending them up, and I have a couple other requests that I would like to share. Uh, Heather and Gary Birch are excited to welcome a new grandchild. Their daughter Kelly had a baby boy yesterday, healthy but no name yet, uh, but we are going to rejoice in that birth. <laughs> and then a few prayer requests for... Uh, some recoveries. Leslie Dunst has asked prayer for her mother. Her mother is recovering from a stroke, and we would pray for her. Uh, Bill Collar is, has just been transferred to a new rest home nearby, closer than he was, and hopefully uh, getting uh, the care that he needs there. So let's be in prayer for Bill as he recovers. And Lisa Contrella's brother passed away this uh, just a, a couple of days ago on Friday, and so we would ask for prayers for Lisa and her family as they mourn that passing. And yesterday we had the celebration of life service for Randall and Joy Walker. Uh, it was a very nice service. Uh, thank you to those that could come. And we just want to remember to keep the Walker family in prayer as they, they mourn the passing of uh, really two parents and a brother within the past uh, two years. All right, at this time, let's go to God in prayer. If there's a praise in your heart today, if God has done something special in your life and you want to take a moment and say thank you, Jesus, let's have a moment of silence. Let's lift up our praises before our Lord. Is there a struggle that you're going through? A decision that you need to make? A problem you're facing? A situation at work or at home or dealing with medical concerns, financial issues, life changes, spiritual problems? Whatever it is, we believe God hears us when we pray. And I invite you in this time of silence to lift up your prayers before the Lord. Let's have a moment of silence now to be still and to listen for God's voice. Almighty and everlasting God, we come before you today with a sense of your presence here among us. Lord, we feel the burden of the call that we all have on our lives to represent you to the world, to find our peace with you, and to share that peace with others. And Lord, at times it's a burden, at times it's a blessing. Whichever way it feels today, Lord, we know that you are with us, and we believe that you walk with us through life's up and downs, through life's good times and joys, as well as through the valleys that we all walk through. 
And Lord, we pray today that you would walk with us and that we would feel your presence to guide us, to shine light into our darkness, to give hope into our despair, to give unity into our division. And ultimately, Lord, to lead us to a better understanding of your love. We pray today for our church. We pray for these kids down in Sunday school and for their teachers, for their parents, not just here, but at regular school as well. Lord, we pray also for those that are gathered here today, those that are online with us watching, those that are searching for the touch of your spirit, for the hope that is offered in Christ. Lord, may we find it, and may we turn to you for it. And Lord, we pray for our world, for the problems that our world faces. We face them not only as individuals, as churches, as families, as communities, but worldwide. There are bigger problems than what we can even comprehend. Help us to do our part. Help us to pray, but also to act, and in our own sphere of influence, to do what we can to make a difference. All of these things we ask in the name of Jesus, and we pray as you taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from Luke's gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. But I, I hope you brought your Bible with you because we're going to be looking at a variety of different passages throughout the scriptures that seek to answer this question. Why? Why? You fill in the blank. I'm sure you've all got your why. Why? And the people of Jesus' day also questioned. And I find it interesting that Jesus didn't really give them an answer to two questions that they posed to him. Uh, and, and yet he gave them a perspective. And that's what I hope to do in this sermon series. And I'll be honest with you, we might not get through it today. We probably won't get through all of this lesson. So we're probably going to break this into two parts already from week one. Uh, but I, I believe that it's important to cover it authentically. And so we're going to try to do that as we look at the new series, Why? Finding Faith When We Can't Find Answers. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Let me give you just a little bit more context. In the ancient world, uh, you remember the gladiatorial games. Uh, it was a brutal world. And sometimes for entertainment. They would have gladiators meet, but they would also have other things they called games where they would bring Christians in and kill them in front of others uh, or, or criminals or whoever. It was a, a brutal time that they lived in. And apparently what must have happened here in this context is that some Galileans, we assume were Christians or, or Jews, were offering sacrifices as was the practice for people to do. And Pilate, who we know of as the one that was ultimately uh, the one in charge of Jesus' crucifixion, uh, must have, we assume, had those very Christians slaughtered and mixed their own blood together with the blood of the animals that they were sacrificing. That's what we guess was the context here. And then uh, there must have also been a situation where a tower somewhere fell on some people and killed them. And the people were wrestling with these questions, saying, why did these things happen? They addressed them to Jesus. And here's his response. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we come before your word this morning, we pray that you would speak to us. 
Open up our hearts, open up our ears, open up our minds to receive and to respond. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's really an age-old question, isn't it? It's an age-old question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do the innocent suffer? And I would guess that if I were to phrase that question to you or ask you to phrase a question to me with a why, fill in the blank, you've probably all got your stories. Either that you have heard or lived through or experienced yourself on, on a terrible tragedy that has taken place either in your own life, in your own family, in your own community, or in the world at large. And you've probably got a hundred different why questions. How could God allow this to happen? Where was God when this happened? And why in the world did it happen? It just seems so unfair, so unjust. I can remember one of the times I wrestled with this question, and there have been many, uh, but one of the times I was a student at Penn State University back in the early 1990s, and I remember on campus, on campus, a tree branch fell and killed, I believe it was a 21-year-old student at the time, I still remember her name was Valerie, and it, it just shook us. I mean, just walking to class like the rest of us, that could have been any of us. A tree branch fell and killed her. Why? You know, if you go and Google tree branch falls and kills, dot, 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 you'd be amazed how many tree branches fall and kill people. And it might make you wonder, my goodness, is this, is this God's lightning bolt? Is this God sending judgment on someone? Because it sure seems pretty specific. I mean, it seems random, but the, imagine the odds of you walking under a tree and that moment the branch breaks and falls on you it just seems like that would only happen once in a while, but it happens more than you would think. We're left to wrestle with those questions. Do you wrestle with those questions? And how do we come up with answers for them? You know, we're gonna take a look at what Jesus had to say when we assume he was asked some of those questions. Why did this happen? Why did that tower fall and kill those people? And, and it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus doesn't give a direct answer to the question. Jesus gives a perspective, but he leaves them to wrestle with that answer. Jesus himself, who I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven one day, I'm going to be asking God some of these questions. Is God going to answer them? What if, what if there is no answer? What if there's more than one answer to the question? Uh, ultimately, I believe that there is one, more than one perspective. I mean, I'm kind of giving away the series right now. It's called Finding faith when you can't find answers. So if you're here today looking for the answer, I'm not going to give it to you. I don't have it. I've studied it. I've read about it. I've tried to come up with answers. But ultimately, I haven't been able to, and I'm guessing you haven't either. But what I want to share with you today and in the next few weeks are some different perspectives that might help us to wrap our minds around this problem of evil, this problem of suffering, and see what are some of the biblical approaches to that. Now, I have to confess, we're going to be looking at more of an academic approach to this sermon and to this series than what I normally do. What I mean by that is I like to just take one passage of Scripture, exposit it, study it, bring out some truths, share some stories that teach it and inspire, and, and then we move on. This one is almost going to sound a little bit more like a classroom lecture, but I hope it won't be boring. I hope that it will fascinate you as it fascinates me to look at the Bible in all of its fullness and see how different people in different times and in different cultures responded to the life that they were living and the situations that happened around them. So we're going to be looking at Genesis, we're going to be looking at the law, the Old Testament prophets, uh, New Testament, Paul, Revelation, uh, all kinds of different places. So that's why if you didn't bring your Bible today, bring it next time and kind of flip around with me and, and we'll see what we find. Uh, but first, let's take a look at the biblical problem of evil, or really it's more of a theological problem of evil. And it's been spelled out by different philosophers, theologians, scholars, and, and regular people like you and I over the years. One book that was pretty pivotal matches the question that I asked at the beginning. Why 
Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? It's a book by Howard Kushner, who was a rabbi, and, and he addresses that question and breaks down the problem of evil in this way. All right, there are three suppositions that we make, and they are this. Number one, that God is all good. And we believe that. We believe that God is all good, that there's nothing evil in God, that there's no badness in God, no wickedness. God is 100% good, 100% righteous. We, we bring that as a supposition. Number two, we believe that God is all powerful, that God can act, that God has the power, God created the world and everything in it, and God can intervene. And we believe in miracles, and we believe that God intervened throughout history, so we believe that God has the power to do that. And then the third supposition that we also believe because we see it is that suffering and evil exist because we've lived through it. We've seen it happen. And here's the problem of evil that all three of these things cannot be true. Because if God were all good and if God were all powerful, in other words, he's a good God, 100% good and does not want evil and is not evil, and if God has the power to stop evil, then why wouldn't God stop evil? So Rabbi Kushner's book takes that approach of, of examining these things and he determines that although God is all good, evil exists and so therefore God is not all powerful. And, and it's an interesting take on that uh, and, and I would encourage you to read that book but you know, classic Christianity struggles with that because we believe that God is all powerful and so how, how do we wrestle with this question? What in the world do we do with it? How do we find an answer? You know, I've, I've read extensively on this subject, and uh, I, I, again, I don't know that there is an answer, but there are different perspectives that I'll share. The Bible does address this question in a variety of different ways. And so let's take a look at a few of those ways. All right, I'm gonna give you six different biblical perspectives on the problem of evil. And I'm using two books as my guide for this sermon series. One is the book, Why? by Adam Hamilton, and the other is the book called God's Problem by Bart Ehrman. Now, Adam Hamilton is a Methodist pastor, United Methodist pastor in Kansas. He has the biggest, I think it's the largest United Methodist church in the United States, huge, and he's a prolific writer, uh, a 100, about a 100 page book that concisely addresses this problem better than any book that I've ever read. I, I highly recommend it to you, it's called Why. You could read it in a day, um, and it doesn't ultimately answer the question, but it shares some perspectives that I have found more helpful than some of the much thicker, longer, heavier tomes that I have read on the subject. Uh, the other book I'm looking at is God's Problem by Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman was a Christian evangelical fundamentalist pastor and scholar, and he eventually turned to agnosticism because he couldn't answer the problem of evil. He, couldn't, he just couldn't come up with how a, God, a good God, an all-powerful God exists and allows evil to happen. And so the route that he took was actually agnosticism. Uh, but he still has some wonderful thoughts uh, or, or academic thoughts on the problem of evil. And so I've used his book as a reference point as well. And I hope that you'll find some of these things helpful as you wrestle with that problem of evil. The first perspective that I want to share with you is what's known as the classical view and this is the classical view of the Old Testament law of many of the Old Testament prophets. And this one's hard to hear. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. This one's hard to hear. This is one where we might look and say, well, I could see the Quran saying something like this, but, but my Old Testament, my loving God says these things? It's difficult. And yet, it's in our Bibles and we have to wrestle with it. Okay? We have to wrestle with it. Let's look at some scriptures that depict that classical view of evil. Deuteronomy 28. I'm going to read to you verses 58 to 63. Again, turn in your Bibles there if you have them because this is only one small passage. There are others as well. But I'm going to read the whole thing uh, and then we'll end with this part of it. But just to give you an idea that the people of that day and age believed that if, if they followed and obeyed God's laws, God would be good to them. If they disobeyed God's laws, God himself God himself, not circumstance, not consequence, not some you know, un unknowable thing. God himself would punish them. Moses is speaking. He says, if you do not carefully follow all the words of this law, which are written in this book, and do not revere this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, 
Pay attention to who sends these things. Not they happen, not nature. The Lord will send fearful plagues on you and your descendants. Harsh and prolonged disasters and severe and lingering illnesses. He will bring upon you all the diseases of Egypt that you dreaded and they will cling to you. The Lord will also, the Lord will also bring on you every kind of sickness and disaster not even recorded in this book of the law until you are destroyed. You who were as numerous as the stars in the sky will be left but few in number because you did not obey the Lord your God. Then this, just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and increase in number, so it will please him to ruin and destroy you. You will be uprooted from the land you are entering to possess. Wow. God is love. How do we wrestle with that? How do we grapple with it? In the Old Testament times, this was a view of the problem of evil that they had. And it wasn't just Deuteronomy. Let's look at what it had to say in Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet of the uh, southern kingdom during and after the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. So he had been warning the people, if you fall away, if you don't fall, same thing Moses said, if you don't follow these laws, God is going to destroy you. God is going to wreak havoc upon you. God will allow bad things to happen. No, no, no. God will allow is the next thing we're going to look at. God will cause bad things to happen to you. And, and Jeremiah spells that out in very harsh terms here in this passage. 8, 13 to 17. I will take away their harvest, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine. There will be no figs on the tree. And their leaves will wither. What I have given them will be taken from them. Why are we sitting here? Gather together. Let us flee to the fortified cities and perish there for the Lord our God has doomed us to perish and given us poisoned water to drink. Why? Because we have sinned against him. We hope for peace but no good has come. For a time of healing there was only terror. And then he goes on to say and at the end verse 17 see God is speaking see I will send venomous snakes among you vipers that cannot be charmed and they will bite you declares the Lord. Again, my goodness. This is our Old Testament. This is our Old Testament law. And it's hard to argue against the idea that they believed at that time God punishes sinners. The problem of suffering and evil in their minds was resolved by saying that God punishes sinners. That's why suffering happens. And, and they spell it out clearly. So if you sin, if you are wicked, if you don't obey God... God himself will punish you. That's why evil happens. Hard to wrap our minds around that. Hard to understand that, but I'm, I'm sharing it with you to say that as we interpret this Bible, we, we have to read these things. We have to wrestle with these things and, and say, well, why do, why do they write that? Why do they think that? Do we think today that when we do evil things that God is there with those lightning bolts to punish us, to make a tree branch fall on our head or to give us every disease that's not even recorded in this book, everything imaginable, that God is out to ruin us. It will please God to ruin us. Uh, you, you know, I struggle with that. I hope you do too. I mean, I take the Bible seriously. I, I believe that that's what they wrote at that time because that's the way they understood God at that time. But I struggle with that view as a human being and as a theologian and as a pastor and as a follower of Jesus. It just doesn't seem to fit with the view that I have of God now but that's in our Bibles. How do we wrestle with it? Uh, it? There is one viewpoint, the classical view of the problem of evil, and, and that, that's it. Uh, basically, it comes down to two things. Good people are blessed in this life, and bad people are cursed in this life. That's what it comes down to. You follow God, you're going to be blessed. You do away with God's will and God's laws, you're going to be cursed. Um, it, it's spelled out pretty clearly. There's a lot of other passages I could look at, but I just want to try to touch on a few of these today. So I'm going to move on, but I, I want you to have that understanding that if we, we believe because of the Bible that if I'm good, if I try to live a good life, if I try to do the best I can to follow the ways of Jesus, God will be good to me. And, and if I don't, then suffering will happen. And so we struggle with that because sometimes we try to be good. Sometimes we try to live a good life, and yet we still suffer. 
So, how, how why, why? Uh, the classical view would say because you did something wrong um, and, and God is punishing you for it. Uh, that's one viewpoint. A second viewpoint that I want you to look at is what I call the consequential view. The consequential view, it's basically the idea that, that actions have consequences. God, suffering happens not because God causes it to happen, but because God allows it to happen. God allows sin, and sin has consequences. Let me share with you a story that happened to me just the other day. Uh, chain reaction. This will make uh, some of you shudder. Makes me shudder as I think about it, but uh, I was out in my yard the other day, and there, there's a tree branch hanging low. Every time I mowed the lawn, I had to duck under it, and so I thought, it's time to cut down that tree branch. So it was a pretty decent-sized branch out there. Uh, so I got my ladder, and I want you to know I'm very careful with ladders. You know why. And so I made sure that it was stable, and, and I saw where I wanted to cut, and I made sure it was over a little ways from where the ladder was so that the tree branch wouldn't fall on top of me or anything. And I made sure that ladder was nice and stable. I didn't go up too high on it, but I fired up the chainsaw, and I went up, and I did my little cut on the bottom, and then cut off from the top. And here's the problem, all right? I, I discovered that there's a chain reaction that takes place. When, when you cut a branch, all right, it's heavier at this end than it is at this end, okay? And branches, for some reason, when you cut through them, they don't just fall straight down. So here's my ladder and me. Here's the branch. It didn't just fall straight down there. Where you cut becomes a pivot point, a hinge. And what ended up happening is, of course, when I finally cut through it, thankfully I turned the chainsaw off, the tree branch pivoted and hinged and swung down, knocked over the ladder. I dropped the chainsaw. I fell and landed on the ladder. And thankfully, I'm just a little bit bruised. Uh, I mean, that could have gone a lot worse. But fortunately, it didn't go that badly. Um, I'm still a little bit sore today. But why did all that happen? It was a chain reaction, right? It was a domino effect. And, and that happened one after another. Dan's back there shaking his head saying, do not let that pastor have a chainsaw ever again. <laughs> I know, Dan, I know. I don't always think ahead. I thought I was, but I didn't. But there was a chain reaction that took place, a domino effect. This caused this cause and effect, consequential. I'm sore right now, I'm bruised right now because I did something stupid and a chain effect took place. And, and that's part of the idea behind the consequences of evil. Now let me take that a step further though, okay? I'm sore, I'm bruised because of my own dumb decision. But let's say that I had one of my kids there holding the ladder for me or something and that branch was heavier than what they were prepared for and they got knocked over too and maybe got hurt. Maybe the chainsaw fell on them. Uh, maybe they tripped and got caught up in the rungs of the ladder and twisted an ankle or something worse. Who knows? Uh, they didn't make the stupid decision, but they still might have gotten hurt. I remember hearing about my grandpa once when he was working with his brother, Uncle Charlie, and Uncle Charlie was up on top of a ladder hammering something, and grandpa was down holding the ladder, and when Uncle Charlie was done, he just <laughs> the ladder, you know, hit, hit, oh, you know. Hit poor grandpa in the head with it. Um, you know, it's it just, uh, grandpa was an innocent party in that. And yet, he suffered. And, and that's part of the consequential problem of evil is that the innocent sometimes suffer because sin has consequences. God allows sin to happen. Let's take a look at a couple passages of scripture that illuminate that for us. Joshua 7 uh, tells the whole story about Achan and Achan's sin. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details about it, just to say that uh, in ancient Israel, they would attack a city, and they were supposed to destroy everything, put the ban on that city is the way they put it, and they were often told to either destroy all of the idols, burn them up, or set them aside for God, for God's temple to be melted down and used in uh, you know, God's temple in some sort of fashion. And they were not typically, sometimes they shared in the plunder, but a lot of times they didn't, and they were told not to share in the plunder. And Achan took some of the plunder and kept it for himself and hid it in his tent. And as a result of that, the Israelites started to lose the next battles because one of their own had disobeyed God. And so next time they went out, God's hand was not with them. And when they tried to discern to find out why, it became revealed that Achan had sinned in taking some of the items that were not to be taken. And because of his sin, him and his entire family were killed. 
as a result of it. But not only them, but also the, you know, the Israelites had lost battles as a result, and so Israelite soldiers had died. And here's what Joshua tells the story in chapter seven, but he recaps it there in Joshua chapter 22, verse 20, with just this verse. When Achan, son of Zerah, acted unfaithfully regarding the devoted things, did not wrath come upon the whole community of Israel? He was not the only one who died for his sin. That summarizes the consequential view of evil, that because God allows sin to happen, and we as human beings can make evil choices and stupid choices, sometimes there's a fallout to that. And sin has a consequence that goes beyond the sinner, and that is why the innocent can suffer. Uh, a variety of reasons, you know, and I'm gonna stop here. I thought I'd get to number three, but I didn't. And I didn't even get to Luke 13, which was the passage we're wanting to look at today. Uh, but I, I want to just take some time on these things and, and allow you a chance to wrestle with these. And I'm going to bring it to a close just by sharing with you that, as I said from the beginning, the series is called Why? Finding faith when you can't find answers. I'm not going to answer this. But I am going to pose some questions that I, I hope will help you wrestle with these perspectives and then come to this conclusion. Maybe Jesus didn't come so we could find answers. Maybe Jesus came so we could find faith. And what we see in the Bible is a book not of people who had all the answers, not of people whose life was good all the time, but people who wrestled greatly with, with questions, people who struggled with the problem of evil and yet found faith anyway. And often that's our journey as well, not to find answers, but to find faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this uh, look at the problem of evil and we pray that as we study it further that, uh, number one, we pray that we would grapple with these questions, that we wouldn't just gloss over them and pretend they don't matter. Uh, lives are at stake. People's struggles are real. We need to acknowledge that. Sometimes our struggles are the ones that are real and we can't give it a cliche and just gloss over it. Uh, and yet, Lord, we do want to find faith in the midst of that. And we pray that you would lead us to a perspective that shapes our faith and ultimately points us to run towards you, not away from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our offering time and our ministry moment today, I want to do a continuation on something that we started a couple of weeks ago. I asked Leslie Brock from the Lemoyne Center to come here and share with you about the volunteering opportunities that were there for their homework and more program. And I'm pleased to say that uh, Trinity responded and we had volunteers from Trinity uh, sign up for that and go and attend. And uh, we went on Monday of last week and Wednesday and we're still looking to go on Wednesdays. So if, if this is something that interests you, uh, it, it's, it's a very worthwhile ministry. I want to share that with you. It's very worthwhile. It isn't easy. They have anywhere from 50 to 60 to as many as 70 or 80 kids that show up. And they do have some staff there that are helping to oversee things. Uh, but a lot of it is done by volunteers. And I, I want you to know that when I told the coordinator, Leslie, that we had a team of volunteers coming on Wednesday, uh, she saw that as an answer to prayer because they, they have college students that will often come to get some experience with their edu you know, education majors that will come. But she said, we only have one coming that day. Normally we have three or four or five and we didn't know what we were going to do. So Trinity sending a team there helped to make a, make a safe place where we, we did have enough volunteers because Trinity helped with that. So thank you for that. And I believe that uh, God is leading us to this ministry. So that said, um, there are different ways that we can help with that. Um, we are still looking for volunteers. If, you, if Wednesdays are good for you, they could certainly use you Wednesdays, but they can also use you Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday as well. There are other ways to get involved. And if you do have uh, an interest in that, please sign up on the sheet out there in the Welcome Center, or just talk to me and let me know you'd like to help. Uh, it, it is a wonderful ministry, and it is a ministry to a, a lot of kids and uh, in the Washington community, black, white, uh, different ages from probably five years old up through 13 or 14. Um, it's difficult, but it's worth your time, very fulfilling. And if you'd like to help with that, uh, please let me know.
If you'd like to just make a do donation to Trinity today, the offering plate is there in the back, and you can also give online or send a check in throughout the week. And, and know, as I always say it every week, that uh, your giving, your faithful giving to our general fund helps us to do more. When our own needs are met, uh, we are so much more able to go and, and help meet the needs of others as well, and, and you help with that, so thank you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the ways that you have blessed us, and Lord, we thank you for new opportunities in ministry, like helping at the Lemoyne Center. Lord, we pray that our church would embrace that and that we would find ways to minister in your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, I'd like to invite our musicians forward for the morning anthem, a new day psalm. What a way to send us out. Amen and amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.